As you listen, keep in mind that though this podcast features medical and other professionals and regularly speaks on the topic of psychoactive substances in a positive light, nothing heard here should ever be taken as medical advice or as encouragement to consume any of the substances mentioned, especially the ones that are blatantly illegal in your country of residence. Listen critically and always check in with yourself before acting based on anything you hear or read on the internet. Hello and welcome to another episode of At Mine Radio. I am your host, as always, James W. Gesso, and today we're going to jump right into the interview we have with Mark Hayden. Instead of me going off on a little bit of a tangent towards all the things that I'm doing and all the things that I'm excited to promo to you before we get into the honorable speaker of the day. So, having avoided all of that, a brief look down at Mark Hayden. He is the adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia School of Public and Population Health. He is chair of the board of MAPS Canada, which is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, and the reason we have him on the show today. He has published on the issue of drug control policy in the following journals, which is the Canadian Journal of Public Health, International Journal of po- Drug Policy, Encyclopedia of Public Health, Harm Reduction Journal, and Open Medicine. He teaches at the UBC School of Population and Public Health, Nursing, Social Work, and Medicine, worked for the addiction services for 28 years in counseling and supervisory roles, has provided public education on drugs and drug policy for over 30 years, offers private practice counseling to parents who are dealing with alcohol, drug, and special needs issues, works with the Health Officers Council of British Columbia on their position papers on the issue of regulated market for all currently illegal drugs, has... Uh, presented in conferences and training events in many countries, and has awarded the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal for Drug Policy Reform work in 2013, and has a great newsletter, which I'm sure we'll talk about as well. So, Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, as I mentioned when I was going through your bio, there's a there's a lot to un uh, there's a lot to unpack there. But specifically, I said that your involvement with maps is the reason why I have you on the show today. Now, not necessarily to speak about maps, uh, though I am going to ask you to, but because it's your involvement with, with maps that got me familiar with what you're doing. Have uh, me know who you are. The very reason that you and I know each other likely um, is because of your involvement with MAPS. So let's open up. What is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies? Well, I'm the chair of the board of MAPS Canada. So um, I can talk a lot about what we're doing in Canada, but MAPS as an organization is multi country, multinational, and it stands for the Multidisciplinary. So there are many people involved, Association for Psychedelic Studies, and essentially our main primary goal is to do research into psychedelics. The path towards legalizing psychedelics is to do stage one, two, and three clinical trials, and then to demonstrate that these substances have benefit, and that's essentially what we're doing. Now, there's subtext to that. One of the things that you have to do in order to do that is to train psychedelic psychotherapists because our research involves psychedelic psychotherapy. And so we put together training programs for those folks, and then we hire them and run studies. Um, We have a long-term goal of eventually working with best practices manuals for legal psychedelic psychotherapists. Great, and you guys are also sort of a, like, well, MAPS, the larger MAPS is kind of a a lobbyist group in a way too for uh, the transformation of the legalities around scientific research around psychedelics, yes, no? Well, that isn't one of our functions, no. 
Now, we all have opinions about that, and we often offer our opinions. But in terms of the role of MAPS and MAPS Canada, it's actually to promote and do research. Um, individually, we have opinions, and we do speak about our opinions, yes. Okay, great. Well, I'd love to harvest some of your opinions in a few minutes here. What is MAPS Canada all about? And um, you're the first person I've had on the show to specifically represent MAPS. And I think it's a great opportunity to specifically have you on because of your involvement with um, as the chair for MAPS Canada. What is your role there and what is MAPS Canada seeking to do? What's well, why well, let's start out as to why it exists. Um, I, I speak at many conferences around the world, and I'm usually on the final panel. I talk in drug policy reform conferences, and I'm the solution guy. So what I talk about is a regulated market for all currently illegal drugs based on public health principles. That po usually puts me on the final panel of the day. And often, Rick Doblin has been on the same panel. So Rick talks about psychedelics, and so he's also the solutions guy. And I saw him doing his presentation, and he saw me doing my presentation, and I realized he needed me and I needed him. I needed him because I wanted MAPS Canada to exist, because at the time I was working for a large complex health authority and busily trying to engage my organization mm -hmm. around a serious discussion of the benefits and healing potentials for psychedelics regarding addictions, and I wasn't being successful. So I decided I wanted to become a lot louder about the need for our society to take psychedelic healing seriously. And so I needed a hat to wear when I was on the podium talking about this stuff that did not represent my employer. So I needed Maps Canada to exist. And then Rick Doblin had a study that he was starting in Canada, the MDMA assisted psychotherapy study. And he wanted an organization that would allow us to give Canadian tax receipts to Canadian donors. So he needed me and I needed him and therefore MAPS Canada exists. Great. So that also provides a, a insight as to why you're involved with MAPS Canada. What got you interested in drug policy reform and, and psychedelic healing in general? Well, I worked for the addiction services for close to 30 years in a variety of different roles. And I was aware that we, we weren't very effective at what we did. You know, we had the best trained counselors. We had fabulous personalities. We had warm, engaging, wonderful people who were highly skilled. And at the end of the day, our ability to actually influence people was relatively low. And if I think about the potential that psychedelics offer that equation, it's absolutely huge. Um, there was a woman named Sandra Carpetis who ran the Ibuga Therapy House on the Sunshine Coast for many years. And she was a single woman. She just ran the program mostly by herself, but with some help from other people occasionally. And it was a very, very small budget operation. And, and she was demonstrating a level of effectiveness in terms of treatment for addictions that was unparalleled to anything that my large corporation was doing. And I kept in touch with her and she kept reporting the same levels of success. And I had clients going through her program and coming to me, and essentially, uh, the, the classic example was a fellow who walked in my door saying, I've, and I knew him well, he had had 10 years of heroin addiction, and then he was on 150 milligrams of methadone. If you don't know methadone dosages, that means he was on a lot of methadone. Normally, that level of dosage of methadone would take about a year to withdraw from. It'd be a long, slow, painful process. And he walked in my office and he said, I'm not an addict anymore. And I said, explain what that means to me. And he said, well, I'm just not an addict. I've taken Ibogaine. I've done it once. I have no withdrawals. And I said, so what are you going to do? And he said, well, I'm going to go out and get a suit and get a job. And, and essentially, I said, okay. And he walked in my next my office next week, and he was hardly recognizable, but he was he looked so different. And, um, and he subsequently went out and got a job, and he never reported any heroin withdrawals. Now, he was unusual, to be honest, uh, just to be just to be fair, he, he was an ideal candidate in many respects in terms of the fact he didn't have a trauma history. Um, I begin does not cure trauma. And, um, and he, he was really ready to make some changes. So, um, so his profile was perfect. Uh, but it worked. And my attempts to engage my organization around looking at this seriously um, were largely unsuccessful. Now, that's actually changed. Just to finish the story, I subsequently required, retired and have talked about maps very publicly. And then uh, one of my goals is to engage the public in dialogue around the healing potential for psychedelics. And um, one of the 
things that I've done recently is I published or I've submitted a paper for publication looking at how psychedelics should be regulated in a post-prohibition world. And, um, and I sent that to the current and new medical manager for the addiction services and have subsequently got an invitation to come and present to their group about the regulation of psychedelics. Mm, that's exciting. So they've been in the media long and hard. There's been a lot of attention to the healing potentials. And so I, every time a new or newspaper article comes out, you know, in a legitimate um, high profile media outlet, um, I send I send the link to the medical manager and eventually he's invited me back. So things are moving slowly. Cool. It's a long, repetitive process. I'm curious, uh, what do you what do you see as the reason why the conventional addiction therapy that you were working with um, prior to getting involved with MAPS why wasn't it working? What's it missing? And, and from what it's missing, what is it that the psychedelic psychotherapy is offering? Well, let, let's let's take a, a look at that question by asking a slightly different question, which is what does what do psychedelics offer in terms of healing? So if we just chase that question, I think that what we'll get is what psychedelics offer down the list is what traditional therapy actually doesn't offer or, or, or is, isn't as powerful as an impact as what psychedelics offer. So if I start out at the top of the list, psychedelics reduce the permeability between the conscious and the unconscious mind. Now let's just look at what I just finished saying. We, li we live a lot of our lives unconsciously. By that I mean, if you think about what it takes to drive a car, when you slide in behind the wheel of a car initially, it's very confusing. There's buttons and knobs and levers, and a huge wheel, and there's three pedals on the floor. I drive a standard. And I only have two legs. And you slowly, consciously fiddle with each one of the knobs and look at the pedals and then start to think about what a clutch means. What does it mean to have two rotating discs that push together in a way? And so you consciously go through the exercise of figuring out one piece at a time of how to drive a car. And then you pull out into traffic and suddenly you consciously are faced with a light that's coming up that's turning yellow and you have to do a conscious calculation about how far you are from it as to which pedal you press, brake or accelerator. And again, this process of learning to drive a car is completely conscious. You do it in your conscious mind. And then two years later, that, con that conscious tape loop has dropped into your unconscious mind and becomes an unconscious tape loop. And you slide in behind the wheel of your car and you put the key in the ignition while you're thinking about lunch. You start it when you're thinking about the radio show. You drive down the highway thinking about what you're going to talk about at the next business meeting you're going to. And you're completely unconsciously driving the car where your conscious mind is busily planning for your day and doing random things as you respond to thoughts about the radio that's ticking away at you. And so our lot of, a lot of our lives are like that. A lot of our lives are essentially unconscious. We drop tape loops into our unconscious mind all the time that then we just operationalize. So what happens when you have a destructive unconscious tape loop? What happens when you have a tape loop in your unconscious mind that is hurtful to you and the people around you? What happens if you have trauma tape loop that plays over and over and over again and tells you how horrible the world is and there's a bomb going to go off and it's going to blow you up and you need to run and hide and... and or, or a trauma tape loop that you've received violence from somebody and you're just afraid of everybody. Or a trauma tape loop that you've been bitten by a dog and so you're afraid of all dogs and you can't go outside because of the dogs. So it doesn't really matter, but these things drop into our unconscious mind and we can't access them because they're unconscious and they just have this life of their own. So traditional therapy tries to access them in many ways and can sometimes, but it's quite limited. Psychedelic psychotherapy really opens up the barriers between the conscious and the unconscious mind. People have a sense of who they are in a very, very different way. So people can actually access the tape loop. Now, it's not quite as simple as that because many trauma tape loops are surrounded by fear. So as people start to approach them in regular psychotherapeutic context, there's a huge fear response that blocks the ability to access the tape loop. So something like MDMA-assisted psychotherapy reduces the fear and allows the individual to actually access the tape loop without the huge fear response. So there are multiple things. One is access to the ability to the unconscious mind. One is the reduction of fear. 
if you think about all psychotherapy, and it doesn't really matter what it is for any issue, the, the predictor from a research perspective, if you want to predict success of the outcome, what you look at is the strength of the alliance between the therapist and the patient. And that will be the biggest predictor of success. And it doesn't really matter what therapeutic technique you're talking about. E ecstasy, MDMA, shouldn't actually have been called ecstasy because primarily that's not what it produces. What it produces is empathy. It produces a connection between people that is profound. And so if you think about the ability for MDMA to assist with the alliance between the therapist and the patient, it's actually profound. Now, we see it on the tapes. I'm involved with this MDMA-assisted psychotherapeutic process, our phase two clinical trial, which is just winding down. And the, the videotapes of all the sessions are reviewed by a, a, an independent racer. And the independent rater does not know if somebody took the MDMA or a placebo, a non-active drug. And, um, and one of the greatest clues that somebody took the MDMA is they become incredibly empathetic towards the therapist. And they turn to the therapist and they say, and how are you doing? And they really want to know. So it, it works. It works as a bonding tool between the therapist and the person who's under treatment. Another factor of psychedelics is the spiritual experience, and different psychedelics offer different sort of dimensions in terms of spirituality. Um, MDMA isn't a particularly spiritual experience, but something like psilocybin and LSD are. So if you want to induce a spiritual experience that will help people to sort of re reflect on their lives from the big picture of the universe, if you want to put it that way, then you offer one of the classical psychedelics and you do psychotherapy in that context. And certainly if you think about the history of alcoholism treatment um, during the 50s, one of the buried histories of Canadian psychiatry is the huge involvement that psychiatrists had with psychedelics in the 50s and early 60s. And there was a lot of research that was done, um, recently captured in a book called Psychedelic Psychiatry by a woman named Erica Dick, D-Y-C-K. Um, and so that history, when you read it, actually shows you that this was something that was a very, very useful tool in psychiatry. And often what they were using it for was to help alcoholism. Because again, alcoholism is a tape loop in the unconscious mind that tends to be very walled in by a lot of belief systems that aren't particularly helpful to somebody. And so a spiritual experience induced by LSD can really give you a different framework on how you're thinking about and seeing the world. So the spirituality is, is often part of addictions. You know, AA is fundamentally... Um, the, the foundation of AA was a spiritual experience. Now, going a little deeper, the foundation of AA was a spiritual experience based on LSD. Um, that's also history that has become unearthed as, uh, as time unfolds. But uh, the final aspect, oh, the other, another aspect is, uh, is detox. You know, specifically Ibogaine. Ibogaine takes away withdrawals, mostly from heroin. The, the clearest examples is from heroin, but certainly from other drugs as well. No, sorry to interrupt. Heroin or just generally opiates? Ah, thank you. Opiates generally. Okay. Yeah. So heroin and methadone. The client example I gave was was um, was methadone. But that, that, most people show up with heroin withdrawals. That's mm -hmm. the most common. So it does take away heroin withdrawals. And in fact, to be honest with you, heroin withdrawals are easier to deal with with method than methadone withdrawals that last a lot longer. So that's the list. So that's the list of why psychedelics are useful in the context of healing. And then you ask the question is, when reg does regular therapy do those things? And the answer is, it certainly tries long and hard to do those things and has some successes. But psychedelics could be a very useful tool in helping amplify all of those various effects. Hmm. So you said that one of the most recent papers that you, that you authored that have um, brought you into uh you said you got you got rehired or you were invited to stand on the board about something regarding how psychedelics will be integrated uh in a pro post -po prohibition world excuse me can you go into what that looks like for you what do psychedelic what does psychedelic or drug regulation look like in a post prohibition canada sure so the the framework that i come from is a public health framework so the goal of a public health framework is to maximize the benefits and minimize the harms. So let's just look at the context of that statement for a second. So any substance can be used and any substance can be abused. And it doesn't matter what substance it is. Um, you, you can actually have an abusive relationship with water. If you drink too much of the stuff, it will kill you. That's an abusive relationship with water. So there is no such thing as a substance that cannot be abused. You can abuse ice cream. You can abuse cookies. You can abuse anything. 
And essentially abuse is when you do yourself or other people harm. And it could be legal harm, financial harm, financial, it doesn't matter. Any, if there's a harm associated with it, then there's a problem. So how do you maximize the benefits and minimize the harms? So if you look at psychedelics and you look at how we understand harms from all drugs, and you, you, have, you have to ask three questions. You have to ask, what is the risk? What is the toxicity profile? What is the risk in terms of people taking too much and killing themselves? So toxicity is one type of harm. Another type of harm is addiction potential. And if you start taking it, you take it long enough, will you not be able to stop? And then the third harm is behavioral. You know, how do people behave when they're under the influence of this particular substance? And so if you really want to understand the benefits and harms of any substance, you ask those three questions. So let's ask those three questions looking at psychedelics. So let's look at the toxicity profile first. Now, all psychedelics are not the same, but Albert Hoffman made the argument that LSD was one of the least toxic drugs on the planet. And his argument was actually based on pharma, pharma um, biology and chemistry. So what he said was, the last time you took a prescription drug, and it doesn't matter what it is, the last time you took a prescription drug, the, the benefit to harm ratio is about one to six. So if you take six times the last time, the, the, six times the dosage your doctor told you to take the last time you took a drug, you've probably got a problem on your hands. So that one to six framework is very, very common with most prescription drugs. With LSD, it's in the thousands. In, in fact, there's nothing else like that. You know, if, if you think about one dosage of water being one glass and you try to drink a thousand glasses of water, you can't do it, you know, without doing yourself significant harm. So one could actually argue that LSD is less harmful than water. So it's incredibly non-toxic. So the toxicity profile of psychedelics tends to be incre inc incredibly low. Let's look at the second factor, is, which is addictive potential. Now, I worked in the addiction services for 28 years, and nobody ever walked in my office saying, I can't stop taking LSD. You know, it just never happened. You know, these drugs don't tend to have any potential for addiction. Um, LSD specifically, you know, the classical psychedelics tend to produce an immediate um, wall of tolerance. So you can't take it repetitively. But it's not just you can't take it repetitively. If you think about the drugs that are addictive, they're, they're very reinforcing in a specific way. You know, heroin takes away pain, cocaine gives you a sense of power and control. Um, nicotine tends to produce a level of compulsivity quite quickly. So that the types of drugs that we tend to want to take again and again have, have this kind of reinforcing element to it. And psychedelics don't. You know, they, they, they are they either show people a mystical experience, or they show people elements of themselves, or they help connect people to others. Or in some cases, you know, MDMA isn't a classical psychedelic. It's, it's, it's a psychedelic stimulant is what it is. Um, but it, it offers people experiences of empathy, connection, and sometimes, quite frankly, fun. But it doesn't have the same reinforcement ability that the other more addictive drugs have. So no, psychedelics are not addictive. They just don't function in that way. So they're not toxic and they're not addictive. So what's, what's the problem with them? If you want to look at harms, it all comes down to behavior. So people sometimes, say, sometimes take psychedelics and do really stupid things. And if you take it and you go rock climbing, you've probably made a really big mistake, especially if you don't take your rope along. So um, if you look at one of the things that I do is I, I have Google alerts. And so I Google words like LSD and psilocybin and, and a variety of things related to psychedelics. And so anywhere on the planet, if there's an incident that happens in the media, I get the Google alert um, about this thing. And, and often it's a problem. There's something wrong has gone on with somebody's use of psychedelics. But every single time, every single incident that I've ever seen, it really comes down to one thing which is essentially lack of supervision, lack of skill, lack of understanding of set, setting, and dosage, and lack of context controls. So let me just think about what I just said. Any Aboriginal group that has used psychedelics throughout the beginning of time, all throughout recorded history, has always provided a framework. The frameworks differ widely. A peyote ceremony is not the same as an ayahuasca ceremony. An ayahuasca ceremony is not the same as a curandero's use of psilocybin mushrooms. They're very different structures that people offer. But they can provide a container, an understanding, and an expectation as to what people will do and how they do it and how they behave and who's in charge. And essentially, people are supervised. So, 
And there's no harms. There's, there's never any harm that happens in that context. If I think about all of the research, the door to research has opened. And if I think about all of the research that's happened, there has never been an adverse event. So essentially, the researchers provide supervision. You know, they provide a psychotherapeutic framework that provides the structure that produces no harm. So it doesn't really matter whether it's ritualistic structure or whether it's psychotherapeutic structure. The, so long as there is a structure, a container, that regulates and manages people's behavior, then these things are essentially harmless. So when you add all that up, you say, then what does that mean? If you want to regulate these drugs, what you do is you say, what we need is a, a college of psychedelic supervisors, essentially. And the psychedelic supervisors will be rep responsible for set, setting, and dosage, and briefing and debriefing of setting up the context of the use, and then they will administer the substance, and it could be individually or in group, it doesn't matter, and they will be responsible throughout the experience, and at the end of the day, they'll also be responsible to their peers for their behaviors. So it doesn't matter what context people provide. You know, a psychedelic supervisor could pro provide um, LSD psychotherapy, they could provide shamanic ayahuasca ceremonies, they could provide um, psychedelic psychiatry, they could provide um, supervision at large multi-day dance, dance festivals. It doesn't matter. Or they could provide a dance experience in an evening. It, it doesn't matter what the context is, so long as somebody's in charge and they work with their peers to establish best practices and manage their peers through that process and respond to complaints when they arrive and they always will. So essentially the College of Psychedelic Supervisors will function quite similarly to the College of Physicians and Surgeons and any other profession that is regulated. Now it's a little more complicated than that because essentially what we're also proposing is that there would be a core package of training that all supervisors would have to go through. And then on top of that, there would be specialized training. So the core training is, would apply to everybody. If I really think about you know, the various disciplines, you know, psychiatry can be one discipline that participates. Um, ayahuasca shamans could be one discipline that participates. And people that organize multi-day dance festivals could be one. And somebody who organizes a single dance evening event could be another. So all of these people would come together at the table and ask the question, what do we have in common? So what we have in common is the need to regulate set setting control and dosage and, and manage that and find out what the context of doing that. But then, you know, psychiatrists are going to provide psychiatric treatment and they're not going to do shamanism and shamanisms are not going to be psychiatrists. So then there's specialty disciplines that are, are superimposed on top of that. Uh, now, in your in your pros in your post prohibition world, you talk about these um, this this college of, of psycho psychedelic counselors, therapists, sorry. Well, psychedelic supervisors, because they're not necessarily counselors or therapists. Now, you I know, think if you're, if you're managing a event, you're not a counselor or a therapist. But right, they are I supervisors. Agree. They're so, supervisors. They're responsible for the set setting of the dosage and the, and the dosage. Okay. So what I'm curious about is, I, I think this is a good idea, this um, being able to be very public about it, being able to... Um, be held accountable by your peers and to be able to talk about where things are gaining like oh here's some things that seem to be working really well in our group and here's some things that were didn't work very well and everyone's sharing these things so it can be refined better over time my question is about is, is twofold and i'm not sure where you're able to go on this question given um given your your position in helping to actually create these regulations at some point but where does the individual who's not interested in supervision or being told that they need to be supervised come in? And where does the, where does the role of, of, of policy um, stop in regards to a person's personal relationship to, say, a spiritual practice with these psychedelics or just their choice to take it um, in whatever context they choose with, without a government-sanctioned supervisor? So I think the question you asked is, can people use a loan? Well, can... It, it, is that the question? The question is, question yes, and then I'll ask you the other question. Okay, so let's deal with the can you use a loan. So we went back and forth on that quite a bit and eventually decided yes. But the issue of using a loan is you'd need to take the basic core training. 
So if you wanted to self-supervise, you can, but you have to be trained. Because if you think about people who have no training, they often do really stupid things. And so people have to have an understanding of set setting control and dosage, how you actually set these things up. And so the basic core training package would be required before people would be able to purchase the psychedelic and then use alone. But at the end of the day, yes, people could use alone, but they would need to have some understanding of what they're doing in order to do that. Mm -hmm. And and is this uh, course going to be something that is available as par, say, sponsored by the government regulating body? Like, is it, Or is this a course that somebody will on their own time have to pay for this course and then pay for, well, obviously you, you probably would have to pay for your psychedelics anyways, but um, I'm, I'm just curious about whether or not, uh, what kind of controls or considerations are in not to essentially alienate people who might already have a relationship to these substances that doesn't include the, um, this, like maybe these are questions now that are almost too soon, given that this, these policies don't even exist yet. But I, I, my biggest concern and my question is about personal sovereignty around the use of entheogens. Is that something that comes up in the discussion? Is that is that something that um, is that is that something that butts butts heads in the discussions when when you're laying down policies? Well, you well, you just asked the question I get asked most frequently, which is you know how. How do people access it individually? And the answer is, if you really want to minimize the harms and maximize the benefits, you need to provide a context for people to using to use them alone, and that requires some training. It's a core package training. It's not a it's not a multi year thing you have to graduate from. I think the essential core training package might be a weekend or two. It's not a huge amount of information that people would need. So. Um, so it's a, a relatively short training package that would allow people to access the core training, yes. And then people would be able to self-supervise. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem unreasonable. Um, so moving on from that question, I am curious, you're, you're directly on the front lines here for this, for this movement in, I guess, all of society, but in particular, um, the... the medical therapeutic culture around around psychedelics what do you see um currently and in the future are going to be the biggest limitations so currently i mean like what is your biggest limitation in uh making this post-prohibition world wherein psychedelic psychotherapy is available for the for the people um what is the biggest uh, obstacle you have to creating that now? And in regards to the future, what do you see in your mind as potentially being the biggest obstacle you'll face once that exists? Well, let me answer that question by looking big picture for a second. So pro prohibition of currently illegal drugs is crumbling. It's crumbling around the planet. Washington, Colorado, Oregon, Alaska, Washington, D.C. have legalized cannabis for recreational adult use. Uruguay has completely legalized cannabis. They were the first full country to do that anywhere on the planet. The Netherlands have had cannabis available to purchase with adults for about 30 years. Portugal decriminalized all drug use in 2001, and you can't get busted for drug crimes in Portugal. So slowly, and Justin Trudeau recently, Canadian, the new Canadian Prime Minister, has stated that he will legalize cannabis for personal possession, which will be the first G8 country on the planet to ever do that. So uh, that'll be interesting in itself. But so, so, so drug prohibition is failing. It's, it's failing around the world, and the discussion sh is shifting. So when I look at the cannabis front, what I see is there's a new tension. The tension used to be between the prohibitionists and the legalizers, and that's moving. And now the tension is between the commercializers and the public health folks. It's quite interesting how I look at the, the green rush, which is the, the desire to benefit economically from cannabis. And I look at uh, the people who've been involved with the cannabis world for a long period of time are essentially um, having to deal with people who are coming in with deep pockets and wanting to benefit from cannabis and they have no history with it. They only have, they only see an economic 
advantage to them. So essentially, the the world of the commercializers is certainly moving into the cannabis world in a substantial way. And so folks like myself are talking about how to regulate cannabis and how it should be available and it should be accessible to people, but it shouldn't be only controlled by people with hugely deep pockets. Now, there's a public health principle here. The public health principle is egalitarianism. If you, there's a wonderful book out there by a fellow named Wilkinson called The Spirit Level. And what he does is he, he asked a very simple question. What is the cause of our health and social problems around the planet? And, and he explores a wide variety of health and social problems, from, from murder to low birth weight babies to um, suicide rates to poverty, you know, the things that really make a society a less healthy place to live. And he explores data from many countries around the planet. And then he starts to draw a very interesting conclusion. What he says that most of our health and social problems are caused by one thing, which is kind of interesting, you know. And then what he says is that one thing is inegalitarianism. It's the difference between the rich and the poor. When you have a huge gap in your society with a very, very few number of people with a lot of money, and most people without very much money, you actually produce a relatively sick society. And so inegalitarianism, not absolute wealth, is a cause of many of our issues. So if we want to approach legalization of drugs and we want to include public health as the framework, the issue of egalitarianism needs to be included in that. So what I see with cannabis is the, the process of rich people getting richer and the people who've done all the work not benefiting um, is actually a problem. So if you look at the solution, the solution in terms of the cannabis world from a public health perspective was you would allow many small people to distribute it and you would exclude the big business. You know, there would be some kind of caps and it would be caps either based on number of plants or overall financial profit or, you know, size of operation or number of employees you have. There's many ways of capping things, you know, profit at the end of the year. There's many ways of capping these things. But at the end of the day, what you'd want is many players who are earning a reasonable income as opposed to few players who are earning a massive income and then hiring people at minimum wage jobs. So that's the public health view. Mm -hmm. So how do you then implement that with psychedelics is you start to ask those kind of questions is how do you how do you engage many people in this process and you don't have large multinational corporations moving in and taking over and commercializing it. So the new tension is between the commercializers and the public health folks. Did I just answer your question? Uh, well, the, the the question, the first question was, what do you see as the is the biggest limitation towards achieving uh, this, achieve achieving regulation? So I guess in a, in a way, and then the second one was, what do you see as the biggest uh, limitation or once that the regulations and the legalization comes in? So in, in a way, you kind of answered both of them with the with the same answer. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, it. it it doesn't. It doesn't go directly into what I was looking. What I was curious about. So, right now, as a person who's moving towards the regulation of um, psychedelics for psychotherapy, what is the biggest challenge that you and Maps is facing in regards to bringing this into a feasible reality? Well, it's interesting. There is really only one challenge right now, which is money. You know, we, to do, to set up a phase three clinical trial and to do it properly so that we produce, our goal is to produce MDMA as a legal prescription drug in five years. That's what we're going to do. In order to do that, we have to hire a lot of people. We need people with PhDs. We need researchers. We need an infrastructure. We need a facility. We need people to answer the phones. We need real estate. You know, we need offices. We need to have spaces where we can see people. So... All of that takes money. And so at the end of the day, our largest hurdle is actually fundraising. The hurdle of people challenging us doesn't exist right now. We really haven't. I've had, um, I don't know, I collect media comments on what we're doing, and I probably have 50 in my Dropbox now. And all of them have been favorable, which is actually kind of interesting. There really hasn't been the voice of challenge saying this is a poor thing to do and you're unwise or whatever. It hasn't existed, which is actually quite interesting. I would have assumed more challenging. But essentially, all we're saying is let's let science be the guide. Let's let science look at what we're doing and decide whether this is beneficial or harmful. And then go with that. One second.
I'm just listening to this really intense feedback. Um, okay, so let's science be the guide. I think this is um, in regards to moving towards psychedelics and psychotherapy being integrated into uh, into our world right now. I think that's a really important perspective because for a long time. It was stigma and fear mongering and essentially bullshit that ha sort of led the guide for for so long. And I think um, moving towards looking at the actualities of the science and what the research is showing is is really important. And not only just the contemporary medical science, but what the history shows us when we look at these substances as they're being used in the um, in the cultural birthplaces of whatever respective substance it might be and where it's been continued to be used um, in you know relatively successful ways once it went under underground in the 70s and mm -hmm. 80s now that being said what I would like to get from you here in the last few minutes that we have together for this podcast is kind of a picture of what kind of science is happening right now now uh, you mentioned that in Canada there are some research happening right now with MDMA. Can you go into what's happening in Canada and what the face of psychedelic research looks like around the world right now? Sure, we're gearing up for our phase three clinical trial. We've succeeded with our phase two, so we have to prove effectiveness with a smaller group of people and effectiveness with a larger group of people that's transferable to the general population. That's the goal of a phase three clinical trial. We've, um, this is a not, we've We've demonstrated it's non-toxic, but now we need to demonstrate that we get the effect that we're saying that we get, which is healing from PTSD. And then we have to do it with a large enough group, group of people that it will be generalizable to the general population. So that's that's what we're gearing up to do now. So uh, busily, what I'm doing is trying to find people who can do psychedelic psychotherapy and trying to figure out what the training for those people are going to be. And that's specifically uh, in Canada? Yeah, this is happening in Canada. Okay. This is happening in Vancouver, specifically. Um I'm, I'm in conversation with other researchers around Vancouver, and there's certainly an interest locally from looking at the effectiveness of psilocybin in, in the treatment of cocaine addiction. The, uh, the, the observation that is being made is that um, heroin addiction is relatively treatable. We have things like methadone. We have things like suboxone. And, and so we can, reg we can work with you know, the reduction of the spread of diseases with those interventions when it comes to heroin addiction. But cocaine and cocaine addiction specifically, the smoking of crack cocaine and intravenous use, is the source of a significant vector for HIV and hep C in our society. And, and we don't manage it very well. We don't have any significant interventions that, that help that. And so the question is, um, would psilocybin, would a psilocybin spiritual experience help people to, uh, to work with their cocaine addiction. That, that's a current interest that's happening in Vancouver. So we're, ha we're having that discussion. Around the world, there's all kinds of interests. Um, so if I even just reflect on some of the, the, the stuff that's happened relatively recently in terms of what's being published, is um, looking at end-of-life anxiety with psilocybin. Um, looking at recidivism rates is interesting. There's a, there's a researcher out there who has looked at whether people go back to jail or not. And his name is Hendricks. And he, uh, the issue of recidivism is you've been in jail and you return to jail, you are considered to be a high recidivism rate. Um, you have to excuse me, I have a cold. My brain isn't working too well here. So um, par pardon my uh, lack of clarity here. Um, so he, he asked a very simple question. He, he, he had access to a massive database of people who had gone to jail and then either were tracked going back to jail or not. And he looked at the various issues that pe people, these people had. Now, the normal thing in our society that we believe is that people don't go back to jail when they have stable jobs, housing, and families. So that's the, those are the protective effects against going back to jail. And so he looked at the database and he observed, yes, those are true. It is true. People tend to not go back to jail when they have stable employment, families, and housing. And then he looked at drug use profiles. And what he observed, one can kind of intuitively guess, that if you smoke a lot of crack cocaine, you're more likely to go back to jail than if you don't. So, okay, that actually makes sense. And then he looked at a, a group of people that were classified as hallucinogen use disorder. Now, hallucinogen use disorder, in order to be classified as having that DSM classification, 
you really just have to use psychedelics. So if you use psychedelics, you are classified then as having hallucinogen use disorder. And then what he observed is that the people who have that DSM criteria are more protected from going back to jail than the traditional things in our society that we believe that are protective, which is stable family housing and employment, which is absolutely fascinating. So that's, that's actually a bit of a revelation. I find that really, really interesting. There's other folks that looked at things like, um, is it useful for not autism, but if you think about MDMA increasing empathy, so one of the things with autism is a disconnect that happens that people have with autism and other people. So the question is, can autism be, can, can the social aspect of autism be improved and helped with MDMA? Very interesting question. So my favorite research comes out of a fellow named, is done by a fellow named Griffiths, who looks at spirituality and meaning and purpose to life. Now, that's a really interesting thing, and many people who take psychedelics actually understand intuitively what that is, but how would you actually measure that? How would you measure spirituality? And they came up with a scale, but actually, when you look at it, you think, okay, th these are reasonable questions. You know, one of the questions is, was this most re most meaningful spiritual experience of your life? Okay, that's a good one. Did you experience oceanic boundlessness? And there's a whole list of questions that kind of try and track what the psychedelic experience is. And he did a study of healthy volunteers who took psilocybin, and then he asked them, was this the most meaningful experience of your life? Was this the most spiritual experience of your life? And a large percentage of them actually said, yes, it was. And then he went back 14 months later and asked the same subjects what their experience was then. And what he got was the experience was either the same, it was still the most meaningful or spiritual experience of their life, or the effect had gone up. Now, I can't name any treatment. You know, if you go to your doctor and you say, I've got a problem, please help me, and they offer you something, and then you go back 14 months later and say, based on what they did 14 months ago, how is the impact now? And I can't think of anything that it will go up 14 months later. So the promise of psychedelics for a whole variety of issues um, is, is quite, quite significant. And they tend to be really short-term interventions. You know, if you look at you know, psychiatric medication, I talk about psychiatric illnesses, I talk about anxiety and depression, all of those things. You know, the, the treatment for them is ongoing and long term, and it just goes on and on and on. So what the promise of psychedelics is, is, is relatively short term interventions, significant, profound, short term interventions that are not costly. You know, the, it doesn't cost a lot of money to, to do these kind of interventions. And, uh, and it seems that they can be very, very helpful in terms of healing people. And so not costly would, um, would denote not profitable, which might have something to do with the lack of money towards the uh, development of psychedelic psychotherapy as a reasonable thing within our society. Yes, we, we aren't getting funded from people with deep pockets who work for pharmaceutical industries. Um, that may change one day, but essentially they aren't funding us. Now, I would understand why they don't fund us, because, you know, they, things like Ibogaine, for example, can't be patented, and so they can't take it and then sell it at a profit. And it's also things like Ibogaine are a very small subgroup of people, people who have heroin addiction, who ever, only ever take it once. So there's no profit motive for that. People who work for a pharmaceutical company, they're really looking for substances that people take a lot of for a long period of time. The profit margin is higher when people take a drug regularly every single day mm -hmm. than once or twice, and then you go on with your life. This would explain why um, Ibogaine is not getting funded, but Naloxone is, uh, is skyrocketing in its price. Yeah. So, uh, that, and that was a reference for the listeners to an episode with Ian Mitchell about ketamine um, and talking about opiate overdoses and um, like addressing opiate overdoses from several episodes ago, which you can find in the archives. Mark, before this, um, before this interview is done. I'd like to ask you, I imagine that there are people who are listening to this who hear you talking about psychedelic psychotherapy, they hear you talking about uh, you know, research happening in Canada now, the, the potentials of research happening soon. Is there any way for people who feel like they're suffering from the very things that um, it appears as though psychedelics offer uh, and are, are seeking a 
seeking a involvement in part of this research is there somewhere that they can go is there is there a direction you can you can point people is that a thing no there is no legal access to no i i mean to participate in studies like to participate in research ah, to yes. Participate in our studies. yes essentially the, that the information of how to participate will be on the maps website the multidisciplinary association for psychedelic studies or the maps canada website um maps canada dot org or com oh no which one is it um but if you check those both you'll find maps canada so the website will let people know i mean we're not planning to put one of these studies together takes a long time mm -hmm. and so we're not planning on actually seeing people until 2017 the process of building the team and doing the training and working out the uh the office issues and the uh the research issues are going to take the, the year of 2016. Well, the idea of relief within two years is probably a lot more hopeful than the idea of suffering with something for the rest of your life because conventional therapy doesn't seem to be working. Is there anything else that you'd like to offer the listening audience before I get uh, links and other contact detail from you? Um, no, fine. That feels pretty good to me. Thank you. Great. So, sure. yeah, totally. What... Um, I don't know if it's public access, but you have you have a newsletter where you send out all the most updated, uh, basically all the media that goes out about psychedelics. Is is that a thing that can get people can sign up for publicly? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> um, um, to, to be honest with you, no. Um, I, it's something I operate from my home computer, and to be inundated with a huge number of email requests probably is more than I can manage. Um, yeah, I've. I probably need some technology to help me with that, um, and I'm not there yet. Okay, well, you know, we could talk about that uh, if you want to talk okay. about that <laughs> okay. kind of technology. Uh, so is there any, what kind of um, details are you able to give out? You are the chair for MAPS Canada. For people who want to reach out, talk to you more about what you're doing, or maybe just support MAPS Canada, uh, where can they get a hold of you? Well, the MAPS Canada website, um, if you search either mapscanada.org or map, mapscanada.com is a good place. Um, yeah, that's, that's the place to start. I, I also have a website. My own website is mark at markhayden.com. But no, it's just markhayden.com. Sorry. Great. All right. Well, I'll make sure those uh, links are in the show notes. And uh, to everyone that's listening, thank you for tuning in to another episode of At Mind Radio. Uh, I have a newsletter <laughs> that is publicly available that you can check out on jameswjesso.com. If you like this, please subscribe to the uh, to the podcast and uh, if you are interested and inspired about what maps canada is doing please go check out the website and whatever support you can offer definitely offer it up because this is a really positive movement in our world right now and thanks for listening and mark thanks for having you on the, thanks for being on the show man great hey everyone james here this podcast and all of my writing is a passion project and brought to you by, well, you. If you believe in the value of what I'm offering, there's a few ways to support, such as following me on social media like Twitter or YouTube, or even just by telling a friend. Word of mouth goes a long way. If you really like what I'm offering and want to bring your support to the next level, please consider donating to the podcast via PayPal or Patreon, or you could buy a copy of one of my books. Head over to jameswdesso.com support to find out more details. And thanks. If it wasn't for you, I couldn't do what I do.